we'll have a Mariuka, also from Finland, like Alan. Uh, hello, Mariuka. How are you? Hello, I'm fine, and I don't have any mosquitoes, but the heat is killing me. It's like 25 to 30 degrees in here, which is really strange. <laughs> so. Yeah, 25 degrees in Finland. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> for weeks now. So this is like highly un uh, not typical situation, but managing. So have my slides here and everything is set to go. Perfect, because the EPI topic is hot on these two days too. So that's that's the perfect uh, uh, yes. alignment. I let you present your slide for 20 minutes and we go back for questions. Thank you. Thank Enjoy. you. Okay, so uh, designing for your API customers with API cycles is the topic and the API cycles is a open and lean method for business oriented API development. And it, I'm, I'm kind of the mother of it. I created it together with uh, some other people some day, years ago and now it has a lot of users around the world in private and public sectors. And it has been an interesting journey. And I think that I'm continuing from what Alan and Claire were telling. So basically, uh, I'm, I'm not covering all those things again. I might be mentioning some of the stuff. But uh, let's see. So I'm a consultant and trainer and also the author, co-author of API Economy 101 book. And I've done well, around 20 years of APIs in different shapes and forms, although I still insist I'm still 25 years old. Do not try to pretend otherwise. And you can find other uh, information about the method at apicycles.com and, and about the book at apieconomy.info. And of course, you can connect with me in LinkedIn. And my company, Osango, which I founded uh, three and a half years now, has grown quite nicely. And we are actually members of uh, the Open API Initiative. And also, uh, we have a lot of courses on APIs, both self-paced uh, and, and also live, together with the, uh, the API community, or API Collective, sorry. And uh, we are organizing locally the API Days Helsinki and North, like it's called this year, first time, together with the Global API Days conferences. So before I jump into the APAP cycles as a method, so the point is that there are some guidelines, and then there are guidelines about API ops, uh, API ops or API development or API management. And here are a few of the uh, public sector guidelines, but then again, many companies have their own internal or even external API design or management guidelines. But many of the companies that we have been talking with and working with don't actually have guidelines for productizing APIs, and that's starting to become a problem. Because like Alan was saying, most of the product managers are totally lost when they don't have the user interface in their products or they are like, like not tangible physical products. So how do you survive in the game of productizing APIs? And how do you have all those different stakeholders like uh, Claire was describing, how do you get them to talk to each other? So you might identify them, but they still don't share a language or methods. For example, uh, business designers or service designers, UI, UI, UX designers, they all use totally different things like lean startup or value pro canvases or uh, concept designs and, and UI designs and tools for that. And then architects and developers use totally different sets of tools. And so how do you get these guys to actually understand each other? I'm in the middle of one of one project, project right now, which is giving me headaches, literally, uh, because of exactly this problem. I'm, I'm sure that you all know this problem exists. So the API cycles method was created because that problem was coming all over the place again and again in different organizations. And so we kind of took stuff that already existed. So like business model canvas, value proposition canvas, uh, 
lean architecture, there was like this minimum viable architecture method that was hardly used because agile projects don't really have architecture. Uh, but it existed, somebody had created it. And then, of course, API ops was slowly becoming the thing that all the API management vendors in one form or another uh, were talking about. But actually, that was only one part of it because DevOps was starting to uh, kind of move forward and be the thing that everybody was doing in the development, but it didn't really cover APIs. So when the teams were developing the, the APIs, they were not able to actually publish the APIs because they didn't validate, they didn't go through the API management tools, they weren't compatible, the designs were not really great, the developer experience was horrible, even if they did end up into the uh, API management tools portals or some developer site manually. And nobody knew if the APIs were successful or not, at least not in business terms and hardly ever in technical terms either. Uh, and these were some of the issues that the teams were meeting. And then if you look at it from a kind of research point of view, there are only few locations. This is from a couple of years back from a research, but still there were only few locations where the APIs were really thriving and where it, they were making business sense. So how do we get these APIs to be more widely adopted? Uh, and the research says that APIs actually thrive in cultures where user-centered design is dominant. Well, does this mean that you should do a lot of UX and UI and have a lot of UI-centric product managers all over the place? Well, it might or might not, because actually what is more important is that uh, you have to have the mindset and the co-location with marketers and developers so that they can actually co-create things and co-create kind of the value prop and, and the matching APIs. And this is important because actually there was a correlation with the global startup index and the economic growth areas and the amount of APIs that were existing. Now, what does this mean that marketers and developers should coexist? Well, it all comes down to the value proposition as a starting point, but not necessarily the user interface like Alan was pointing out again and again, and I totally agree. I wish everybody would start just doing APIs and not start from the user interfaces, but well, maybe someday. Um, so the question is then whose value proposition or, or from whose point of view? So first, of course, we need to think about the end customers, but then we should move to the developers who need to build for the end customers. They might be coding developers, or they might be low code, no code, or even kind of citizen or business developers, but still the guys and girls who actually need to make stuff happen. And so as an end user, I might want the lights to change color according to the ambience I want to create. This is like a very minimal uh, thing, starting from the customer need. And this is a picture from Philips Hue lamp that changes color. Uh, you can even change it with an API. And the idea is that I, for example, did this uh, citizen integration or, or no code integration with Zapier uh, and Slack. So I can get my team members to not be notified with the change of color of a lamp when there are, for example, new messages in a specific Slack channel, like, for example, customer uh, feedback or something like that. Okay, it might not be the most useful use case, but it is a use case. And there's a value prop in that, that I can do this without having to code anything, and I can uh, do it with kind of something that doesn't make a lot of noise, but get, still gets noticed, and it's relatively low cost. So that would be at least for the end customer, uh, a value proposition. It might also be very close to the developer's value proposition, but that comes a little bit later. We'll get back to that. 
Uh, here is a video of the lamp actually changing color, so you can see that it really does that. So here it goes to different shades, yes. Okay, and then if we want to do something more complex, for example, if the customer need would be that I need to make my uh, presentation for API days and I need to have a place that requires concentration or like peaceful place that uh, for work that requires concentration. And then I decided that the Apine ski lodge will solve my problem. So we have this hut at the office. And again, with Philips Hu and some magic with APIs and stuff, I made it so that it, it has a motion detection and, and uh, the lights go on and have a concentration color uh, kind of spectra for concentration related work. Okay, so what about ordering pizza? So this is, of course, again, from the customer's end customer's point of view that I need to have pizza from the nearest available open pizzeria that has less than 15 minutes queue. Okay, fine. So how can you get that value proposition then uh, to the level where the developers are interested in it? Here comes the method. So here's a kind of beginning of the method. So API cycles extend, extends the idea of API ops versus DevOps. Um, it brings the business layer to it, and it brings the whole set of methods. Like you would have a method for UI and UX design, then here you have a method for API design. And it kind of starts from the customer journey often, and, and usually the ecosystem customer journey. And then you start mapping the jobs to be done or the tasks or the touch points from that end user's customer journey to this value proposition uh, canvas. And then you start figuring out, okay, what does the developer need to do? What does the de developer need as gains? And what are they afraid of as pains um, in order to be able to deliver that end customer value proposition and those end customer tasks. And then you come from the value prop canvas down to selecting uh, separate services from the features that you come up with with the value prop canvas. And you might come up with many APIs or just one API from that. And then you take one API at a time to the business model canvas and formulate the, the value proposition from those inputs that you have. And then you start collecting a bit more requirement, requirements with the other templates. And then uh, you actually start making business decisions. So you start seeing the costs and, and the revenues or the benefits. And you start seeing what it takes. And are there even any customers for it? And are there any partners for it? And you start to kind of iterate. And you, you make adjustments maybe. Or you throw the whole thing away. It doesn't make sense to do, do this API at all, or you actually decide, well, this starts to make sense. We should definitely start prototyping this API and go forward with the method. So here's the, an example of a value proposition canvas from the beginning. So you always start with the API consumer. So remember that the end customer is different than the API consuming kind of developer customer. So. Uh, if the end customer wants to eat pizza because he or she is hungry, then the API consuming developer customer probably wants to make an app or a service or integrate it to their whatever Philips Hue lamp or uh, a button or whatever it is that they are doing. And they want to uh, have the pizzerias nearby and they want to have the queue uh, which is the, the shortest queue there. And they want to show the menu to the customers. They want to, the customers to be able to pay and so forth. And so you start looking at those tasks and you start looking at what are the gains and, and you actually ask the developer customers, what do you want to have? What would make your life easier so that you would be able to do this pizza app? And you start getting things like, OK, I hope that I don't need to integrate to all the pizzerias separately. I need to have the availability info, like what's the queue size? Are they open? Uh, what pizzas they have? 
I need to have the geolocation in real time of the deliveries so that the co my customers, my end customers can actually see where the guy is and, and, and see that the pizza is going to the wrong door, like I have had that happen a few times. And then you might have these panes that are usually uh, kind of quality of data or difficulty of integrating or using the API. They are about performance, reliability, security, documentation. In this case, because there are payments and, and maybe customer data involved, then maybe GDPR or some other privacy legislation, PCI compliance or other uh, kind of financial requirements. So all of those go to the pains. And then when you have the gains and the pains of the developer customers, remember they are not only necessarily the developers that actually code the stuff, they might be the organization's problems and pains and gains who actually are developing the app or the other solution. But anyway, you will come up with a set of features or requests, and then you need to decide as a product management process, what are the features that you are actually able to and want to deliver against those needs and to uh, kind of relieve the, the pains that they are having. So you end up with a set of features and then you start dividing those features into services. You might have a payment API, you might have uh, an availability or menu API or delivery API or something like that, which then uh, answers these needs that came from the developer customers. So here are some of the examples that uh, were from the previous examples and one from real life customer of ours. So control the smart devices securely and in real time from internet with any technology and programming language would be something that relates to the Apine Ski Lodge or the <laughs> Slack Plus uh, lamp color change. Then the pizzerias, um, get all pizzerias with availability according to location, build your own pizza app, retain your customer data. This would be for the pizza stuff. And then Rev.com was one of our first uh, developer experience related customers and from US. And they do transcriptions and captions for YouTubers and Binda.com and other places. Uh, and there, the value proposition is the main one is a RESTful API to access Rev's workforce of fast, high quality transcriptionists and captioners. And later they actually added also machine learning abled uh, transcriptions and captions there to kind of be the faster and cost effective alternative. And so the logic of a lot of teams and a lot of designers and business people is that you know, if they need to build some app or some solution, they come to you and say, we need technical help to build this nice app. And we think that we are at a stage where somebody just needs to decide the architecture and then we are ready to go. Well, often this is absolutely not true. So often when they come to you with, we want to build an app, it's actually, you need to start asking them, what the heck are you actually trying to do? What's the, the end game here? And this exactly was what happened with um, water services providers from Finland last spring. So they were basically coming to their uh, development providers and IT companies and saying, well, we want to, to build an app. And then the next question is why? And then we had this whole ecosystem of them and, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and a lot of other guys and girls and we started figuring out what is it that actually needs to happen. And we found out that actually the, the ecosystem of uh, who needed something from the water providers were actually not only interested in the water, they were it, uh, interested in utilities as a whole and having data around the utilities, having uh, kind of smart water meters, smart electricity meters and so. And there were a lot of, uh, organizations interested in that and a lot of kind of different value propositions expected. And so my message is that the tech is usually the easy thing, but then there are all those people, all the stakeholders 
Then there's the ownership of data, APIs and platforms, and centralized and decentralized government and, and organizational things. This was actually presented for UK, UK uh, government. So bear with me with the public stuff. But the idea is that you start with the customer journey. You, you can inject the APIs into any uh, kind of size and shape of the customer journey, but you need to find your organizations or your customers kind of the key thing, the capability, the core thing that they are good at and they should provide us APIs. And you need to come out of the integration orientation to the ecosystem and platform orientation. And that requires thinking of the uh, value propositions because you need to be able to say for each and every API, not just each and every app, what is the value prop of that API? And this is exactly what happened with, for example, when consulting the transport services after legislation opened up or required APIs from all the uh, taxis to airplanes and everything between that were passing through Finland. And, and we had to kind of figure out how the heck, what were the value props, what was the ecosystem journey and how these players were supposed to play nice together. And this was also from a customer case where uh, a customer of ours was starting to figure out how to handle pet healthcare and related data and who are all the players involved in that and what are the different value props for these players in terms of APIs and data. And this is from the example of, of the water services ecosystem where actually uh, the main value prop that the water services suppliers were kind of actually required to handle themselves was the collecting of the consumption data and also uh, keeping the water services infrastructure safe, that data safe, because that is of, of usually national and, and other kinds of security uh, related data. But the collecting of the consumption data was the main thing. And even there, they could work with partners to actually uh, analyze, disseminate, share that data to all those parties that needed it. Everything else could actually be even outsourced with proper APIs in place and proper business acumen in place. Uh, and in building and construction, we work a lot with those uh, customers. So traditional customer journey and, and, and systems are kind of viewed there in terms of these uh, construction companies take on when they are building a, a building and they need the uh, water meter there and they need the consumption data and they need to think about the life cycle of the building. But there are usually gaps in what the water services providers are doing and what they, the construction and building maintenance guys are doing. And to close that gap, we were actually looking at uh, what were the jobs to be done or the tasks that the API consumers needed to do in order to help the water services. And then we made this value prop canvas around that to understand uh, what kind of APIs were actually needed and what were already existing. And we found out that uh, one in particular was not existing. So water services providers didn't have an API for ordering the water meter to be installed. And there were also uh, problems in some of the pipeline locations and, and other uh, data that was, was lacking in the water services in the Finnish market. And I know that that's the case in a lot of other places too. And so when we were identifying those APIs, then we picked one at a time and then we started doing the business modeling and we basically looked at okay who would be interested in this particular value proposition which was water consumption and quality data for your building and real estate in a standard format and integrating with all the other utility data and so this is a both a kind of a business related value proposition like it should be but also kind of from a bit more technical or like solution development point of view and so with all the other uh, steps in the method, you start to get to the bottom of what kind of API should we build and who could actually use it and what are the value props? How, how would we actually tell somebody that this is what our API does? 
And so if you want to get any more info, go to the apfcycles.com, go to osango.academy. There are some courses there. Some are free and university courses. Some are paid. And then there's a free ebook, Eight Ways of Lean API Development. And then, of course, we are having a boot camp together with Alan and Claire and Mehdi and Mike and James Hickingbottom and, and everybody else in the collective uh, in August and a few more in uh, the rest of the autumn. So connect with me and let's see somewhere again. Yeah, thank you very much, Marika. We have just time for one question. Uh, but uh, what I will ask you is that uh, today, how would you uh, sponsor internally such, a, let's say, a API Ops uh, uh, a Cycle initiative, right? If you want to, if you are an API champion and you want, uh, yeah. especially your company, to be onboarded, like what advice you could give? I would say that you need to figure out where your team is at. So if they are very technical, don't start from the business value model and, and the value props. Start from the API audit checklist and kind of at the end, end of the method or, or from the collecting of requirements. That will make them happy. They will achieve something. They will not screw up that much. And then you get to the next cycle and then you can start talking about business value. But if they are very business oriented and, and there is kind of drive for that, then start from the beginning. There is a great uh, actually chat about that, a video uh, which we made in one uh, meeting with some of the practitioners from Germany and UK that had been using the method. And also in the book that you're showing there, yes, API Economy 101, uh, definitely find that in, in your local bookstore, or Google or Amazon. Yeah, really recommend the book. It says a lot of things about the API economy with some uh, interesting research. It's not it's, yeah, uh, uh, that was, science. that's back what science. we were trying to get there because there is not that many books about research around APIs. Thanks, yeah, thank, you very, thank you very much, Mariuka.